thank you for coming. And we have Nathan Clark. He's the tea brarian. He is also the uh, director of the Emmitsburg Library. So he also is really heavy into libraries and tea. So he is here to talk to you mainly about tea, right? Yes. All right. Thank you for coming, everyone. I, I appreciate this nice big group here. Uh, thank you, Robin, for asking me to do a program at the library. As you say, I'm a librarian myself, and so I'm all, always extra delighted to come share my tea knowledge at another library. So I titled this presentation, Tea Awakenings. And in addition to, since we are going to be sampling several teas here over the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes, uh, not only do I want to kind of enliven you with the, the beverage and its properties, but I do want to uh, enlighten you as well as to uh, facts about uh, its preparation and its origins and, and other things about tea. How did I get into it specifically? Well, uh, I was always aware of tea, you know. To me, that meant, OK, there's three boxes on the supermarket shelf that, <laughs> uh, that has tea bags in it. And that's the, the world of tea. And then it just happened so that once uh, on social media, one of my friends posted, oh, sitting here reading a book, drinking tea. And I commented, oh, what kind of tea are you drinking? And she uh, commented back. And it was something I'd heard of, so hadn't yet stepped out of my uh, world. But then a, a third friend chimed in. And this guy was kind of like a mentor in, in other areas, like a librarianship, smart guy. And he said, oh, you, if you guys like tea, you should try uh, Upton Tea Imports. They carry all kinds of tea. And I thought, hmm, well, maybe I'll give that a try. And so I went to their website. And uh, if you want to talk about mind blown, I mean, that just completely bowled me over. And especially when I uh, sent away for their catalog. Yes, there's still a, a outfit that mails a print catalog. And they still do so today, even, which is very rare. And not only does their catalog describe all of their <coughs> tea wares and teas that they've been, but also each issue, it's like a, a magazine. Uh, so like when I first joined in, it was like reversals of fortune in the tea industry, part 17. And that went on for years yet. So uh, yes, that, that definitely was, was a turning point for me. And that was around 10 years ago. But I do want to stress that, yeah, I've been at this kind of thing for 10 years, but I don't consider myself an expert. I still consider myself a student of tea. I sample many, but I have many left to try. And I'm sure if you're into something heavily, you know, very involved, very learned in something, the more you learn that you don't know. I mean, that's kind of something that just comes with the territory when you, when you get into things that way. So here's a little survey. I, I, I guess I'm not sure quite where this crowd would stand. Some of the uh, groups that I presented to in the past have been ones where, like, the, the, the Red Hat ladies, and so they invited me to come speak. So they were kind of a captive audience. You guys have all basically signed up for the program, so I guess I don't know. Where do you think you would fall? Do, do you feel like you're more of a coffee person? Uh, raise your hand if you feel you're mainly a coffee person. OK. Raise your hand if you think you're mainly a tea person. OK. Well, so quite a few. Uh, and I'd say that's maybe beyond the, <laughs> the, the normal distribution that I would experience in, in giving a program like this to a, to a group that I'm just asked in to speak to. So uh, hello, tea people. <laughs> yeah. Anybody here identify with neither <laughs> tea nor coffee? I would say both. Oh, you would say both. OK. That's good. Well, and, I, I didn't give that part of my history. I was formerly into uh, coffee pretty heavily and enjoyed espresso. And I particularly liked French press. That was always my like a nice French roast made in a French press pot. That's that was my jam with coffee. But 
I won't talk a lot about like health benefits. I will touch upon some of that, but that is kind of why I quit coffee. It's because it was hard on my stomach in a way that tea never has been. So I, I can drink coffee sparingly now, but day in, day out, it, I can't really take it. <laughs> so tea is my happy medium. OK, so into the meat of the program here. We got, I got to establish you know, what it is I'm actually going to be talking about. Because even if you said you're a tea person, uh, you may be coming at that from a different angle than I am. Uh, because in our culture and just the, the lingo, the, you know, the, the our vernacular, tea doesn't necessarily mean to a person what I mean when I'm talking about tea. When I'm, say, when I'm talking tea, and mainly in my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about the ornamental evergreen shrub, Camellia sinensis, which is related to all the other camellia flowers. There are several uh, species. They're all native to uh, southern China, Southeast Asia, I, in particular the, the Yunnan province in China is where it seemed to have originated, that is, uh, like cultivation of tea. And it's found wild in China, uh, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, um, and India, which more on that at 11 as far as India goes. But think, think China for the time being. And well, there's an example of what a fully grown tea leaf looks like along with the flower. Now, in some of the teas that we'll see today will contain just the, the bud or the un leaf, so it'll be a much lighter green and a skinnier leaf, but that, that's called a bud. And curiously, uh, but just kind of an aside, I've had a tea that's just solely made from the flower that, that you see in the picture there, just dried and prepared as a tea. Uh, it does not con contain caffeine, but it's otherwise a, a pleasant beverage. It's, it's something different, to be sure. So yes, I, when I'm speaking about tea, and that's the main thing of this program is tea, I mean the, the Camellia sinensis. Now that's by no means a limiting factor, as we'll get into later. <laughs> what I'm not really uh, going to cover today, and what I don't really mean, is like herbal teas. Like I know growing up that was a thing too. We, had a, we bought a lot of celestial seasonings, like sleepy time, and a few others. They were like herbal blends of chamomile flowers and uh, peppermint, lavender, I don't, th those types of things. Uh, there's another word for them. Don't ask me if I'm pronouncing it right. I've always said it as tisane, tisan, tisan, I don't know. <laughs> it simply means an herbal infusion and not the, the, the tea plant, Camellia sinensis. So yeah, those I, I'm really not going to talk about so much today. Because there can be, I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, any, virtually any plant that's not poisonous, you can take and make a, a tea out of or a tisane. So those, those aren't really on, up for discussion today. So uh, back to China here. I want to spend some time talking about Shen Nong. So he's a legendary figure. I. I I mean, you read some accounts, he was uh, called an emperor, or he's kind of like, you know, retrospectively referred to as like one of the three kings of, of, of something. And uh, he was an herbalist. He, he tried all these different types of plants, experimented uh, to find their medicinal and uh, therapeutic properties. And that included plants that were poisonous. And he encountered uh, 72 plants that were poisonous. And so legend has it that the antidote that he turned to was tea. And so he's kind of credited with, uh, you know, obviously as a legend. But th there's likely, you know, as with all legends, there's likely some a kernel of truth in there that may maybe there was a, a renowned herbalist that, that did do a great deal of experimentation and, and, and did, you know, put tea forth as a, a, a beverage that had those properties. Uh, but the, the bottom line is uh, there's archaeological evidence to support it, and 
the tea has been consumed in, in China for 4,000 years. So that's where it began. That's where it's the most refined. And kind of part of what I'll be presenting today is that's still where the best stuff comes from. So over the centuries, uh, things uh, changed, and, and they naturally even changed since this. This is mainly like the Tang and Song dynasties we're talking about here. This is Lu Yu, and he is among a body of Chinese, I'll ca I call them tea literati, <coughs> because during those periods, hundreds of treatises on the preparation and properties of tea were produced. And well, we know this because I think as many as 100 still survive today. Uh, the treatise that is most accessible, and maybe because it's translated, is <coughs> Lu Yu's, the, the classic of tea, the Ta Qing. So, and I had a poem that was from this era. It was called The Seven Bowls of Tea, but I forgot it at home. I was going to read it to you. <laughs> so, but anyhow, it was definitely a, an era of you know, high culture. I mean, I'd almost liken it, you know, to like the European coffee house scene. Think of it in, in those terms, that you know, the, the, the literati that was part of the culture. Now, I mentioned that uh, tea preparation has changed even since then. I mean, back then, like in Lu Yu's treatise on the preparation of tea, he goes into a great deal of uh, detail about, you know, how, how the fire's to be built to heat the water and uh, and he go, that's one of the other things that he's mostly uh, given credit for is stressing, and there, there's even like a legend that goes along with it, uh, stressing the quality of the water. And I will be talking about that later. That you, know, you need to use water of the highest quality of the, the very freshest, you know, closer to the source, the better. That kind of stems from Lu Yu. And uh, yeah. So, oh, and I forgot to tell you, uh, when they made tea back then, it was more of a product similar to like the Japanese matcha. If you've seen that, that's just a, like a bright green powder. It's a pulverized tea that's added. That's how they made all tea back then, essentially, because it was ground into a fine powder and, and prepared with a whisk like matcha is today. So, so today, do we... How, how do we refer to the tea? Is it, is it that it's grown or, I mean, is it grown or is it made? Well, the answer is both. And that's because it's crucial to how the tea will taste and all its properties, the steps taken immediately after harvest. Uh, kind of an area where I'm gonna contrast compare and contrast coffee and tea is uh, coffee can be harvested and then bagged, wait for shipment, ship, and it's still considered fresh a product when it arrives at its destination. Because then after, you know, the, a lot of coffee is shipped here and then it's roasted. It's not grown here in the mainland United States, but it's shipped here in its raw form, and then it's roasted, and then it's ready to consume. Not so with tea, you can't pick the leaves off a plant, put them in a bag, and ship them somewhere, because when they get there, it'll be a rotten mess. <laughs> so you have to process tea, you have to make it close to the place where it was harvested. That's why uh, all the tea factories, they, and they call them tea factories, are located near the plantations where the tea was produced. And in other cases, like particularly in China, you may have a, a more artisanal operation where it's the farm, you know, they're actually doing the, the steps to, to, to process the tea, to make it into what it is. And I'll go into that a bit later to those different processes that are used. I'm gonna to have to keep an eye on my uh, water here to see what temperatures we're running at. 
is, as you'll find out in here, uh, these teas need to be prepared at specific temperatures, steeped for specific times, uh, very precise. And they have food for you all to eat, but I wanted to serve the first tea before that because it is very delicate in flavor and I worry that, well, you have a piece of divinity that's gonna help. You won't be, if the tea's sweet, you won't be able to taste it. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get into that shortly. So yeah, uh, tea clearly originated in China and uh, stayed there for a long time and it was kind of a closely guarded secret. You weren't allowed to uh, export the, the seeds of the tea plant. Tea plants were not allowed to be taken away from the country. And even if they could, uh, in 1650, if you put a tea plant, potted tea plant on a ship, chances are by, it got, by the time it got to uh, Europe or wherever, <laughs> it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have lived. It wouldn't have survived the, the voyage. And part of that would be the, like the exposure to the salt in the seawater. But, uh, so this amazing gentleman named Robert Fortune, he was a, was he a, I think he was a Scotsman, but I think he was of Irish descent. Or maybe he was an Irishman of Scottish. I think he left Ireland because of the potato famine and moved to Scotland. And then he ended up in, in business. And that, that was a big project, was to try and get tea from uh, China so that they could start tea plantations in uh, India, which was under British rule at that time, of course. And so somehow he managed to get into China and while there dress and, and pass himself off as a person of China, Chinese ethnicity and he managed to abscond with over 20,000 tea plants. Now there was a technical innovation that did help this uh, heist along, uh, called the Wardian case. And what the Wardian case is, is basically like a, a glass enclosed case, think like a terrarium. And this enabled the tea plants to be transferred even aboard ship, and they could even be brought up on deck to get the sun, which was beneficial to them, and not be exposed to the salty seawater and to not dry out. In fact, that same invention helped uh, bring the rubber trees to the rubber plantations where, where I think they were going the other way, from Brazil to <laughs> Burma or something. So it just enabled a, a great deal of exporting of exotic plants to places where they had not been grown before, which really uh, fueled the, the, the colonial economies, as, as you probably know. And I think that story is such a, <coughs> a, a wild story that I, I will recommend this book for all the tea in China, How the England Stole the World's Favorite Drink and Changed History by Sarah Rose. And it is about the story of Robert Fortune. So, and I thought it was funny. Just last night, I was doing some additional research because some of these slides are old, and because I, I've given this presentation a couple of times, and I wanted to have up-to-date information about uh, what tea, what, what countries make the most tea, what what are the top tea-producing countries. Well, I couldn't really find information and agreement, and so I'll just tell you, well, it's China, India, and uh, Sri Lanka. It, it, after India, Ch China and India, a lot of sites will have, well, number four is this one, number five, it, there, there's not perfect agreement, but th needless to say, the top tea producing nations are China, India, Sri Lanka. Surprisingly, Turkey is in there, though I don't know how much Turkish tea we drink, so perhaps this ends up in their domestic markets or th there are other countries that are big importers. But also on the list, which was a surprise to me, was Iran. I, I just wasn't aware that uh, 
It was produced in that country in that quantity. Uh, and so reading further into it, the Iranians had a similar, I mean, it was very similar to Robert Fortune, how a, a kind of a high nobleman masqueraded as like a tea laborer on an India plantation and kind of learned the secrets of growing tea and brought that knowledge back to Iran. So, and that's, he's credited with starting the, the industry in his country. So I thought that was kind of fascinating that history did repeat itself in that way. OK, so probably hard to see this chart. But what it explains is how the, tea, the different teas are made. And we'll be going over the different types of tea in more detail here in a bit. But basically, they all start out with um, the first thing over here on the, the green tea branch. It's kill green. That's the first step called wither or sun wither. However you do it, you have to stop the biological process. Because like I said, when you pick a leaf off a plant, that starts something into motion that, OK, it's going to start decomposing. So you have to do something to arrest that. And so in some cases, you know, they're you know, given a quick blast of steam to kill those organisms that cause that to happen. Or they're uh, dried in the sun or on drying racks that, that arrest that process and, and wither the leaves. Then, mostly across the board, the, the process is somewhat the same. Uh, you can see with greens that sometimes that's accomplished with steam, sometimes being uh, fried on a wok. Uh, and basically that's what it is. I mean, imagine a large uh, hand hammered wok that's flat and they just take the tea and they fry it that way. And it's also shaped that way. Like one of the teas we have today, it's, the leaves are, are pretty flat and that's done on a wok. And then, as we'll get into later, uh, green teas are not oxidized. Uh, the red teas, that's what the Chinese call black tea, by the way. I mean, they, they name teas more or less based on the color of their liqueur, the, the steeped beverage. So if they say hong cha, red tea, that they, they mean what we call black tea. If they call something black tea, that's actually a tea where fermentation does really occur, where there is actually a biological process going on. I don't have any of that kind of tea with me today. <coughs> it's called uh, Pu'er, and it's named after a town in China where the, evidently the process originated. And it's a tea where th there's active fermentation going on. It's kind of analogous to like cheese or uh, whatever you would age and, and ferment. <laughs> and there, there's two different kinds. There's the traditional kind, which has just uh, gone through its process and it's pressed into cakes for storing and for aging, because they improve with age. And then, like back in the 70s or 80s, they discovered a way to accelerate that process. They basically you know, lay it all out and kind of spray it down and periodically turn it over, and that accelerates the fermentation process. One is called, I always get them mixed up, because one's shung and one's shou, and one means cooked, one means raw. The raw is the, the, the traditional kind, the, the kind that you can age for 10 years to have you know, even better tea. And the other kind, it's, it's taste the way it's going to taste immediately. And very, uh, Robust. I mean, it's it's probably the closest uh, analog to coffee in the tea world, I would say. And I recall the first time I ever had it. It's like it was very enlightening. It's like wow, I mean, this is it, it really conjured up something in your mind when you you drank it. Uh, it's like the the aroma and the taste. It, it just it was very evocative of like the forest floor. If you've ever like walked around in the forest after a rain, 
in spring, and that, that's <laughs> that, that's really what it, it brought to mind. And needless to say, you, it's it's not for everyone. <laughs> so, and another tea that I don't have with me today uh, is yellow tea. That's another one that most people have not heard of, and it tends to be the rarest one because uh, most of the tea that would be used to make it gets used in making greens. Uh, I'll kind of give you the tasting notes on that. Uh, a good yellow tea, like Huang Shang Mao Feng, uh, has the flavored profile of one that we would recognize around here, sweet corn. That's what it's evocative of, definitely. <laughs> sweet corn. Okay, so we are going to get into trying our first tea. It looks like our water has cooled down. Uh, so this is gonna be a white tea. White teas are the least uh, processed types of tea, period. I'll flip back to that chart. You can follow the white brand. <coughs> Basically, you weather it, which I think in the case of white tea, mainly it means just in the sun, usually. That they're dried, done. So the least amount of processing. Now the tea that we have today is a particular favorite of mine. It's called Yin Sen, or Downy White Echo. Silver Needle is, the, is what it's best known by. And it, it doesn't take too much imagination to see that you know maybe there's a resemblance to pine needles in the dried leaf. And so this is an example of a tea with a specific plucking requirement. These are not like the leaf that was on that early slide that showed the fully formed tea leaf. These are just the buds. And we are going to prepare this in a <coughs> traditional Chinese a brewing vessel called a gai wan, which simply means a covered bowl. And it's basically three parts. You have the bowl, the saucer, and the lid. And the lid does double duty, both as something to keep the heat in, and then while it's brewing, you can kind of use it as a, to create a little motion in the tea and, and stir it some. And then when you go to actually drink it or decant it into a cup, you leave it so that there's just a little slit in there, and then it's poured into the glass. Or if you're just doing solo, you could just <laughs> use it directly. But. Where do you get the, these teas? Well, the teas we have today were all bought from Upton Tea Imports. Where? Upton Tea Imports, they're an online retailer. They're located in Massachusetts. And so also, I use this gourd strainer. This, it's just like a nylon mesh sewed onto a dried out tiny gourd because it just it keeps with the, the Chinese tea aesthetic. Uh, tea is a wood element, so if you introduce like, metal into the surface, you, that kind of clashes with wood. So this is preferred. So. I have a nice, large uh, wood tea scoop that I'll use to put the leaves in there. And in the Chinese uh, way of brewing it, a generous amount is used. And I do have an apparatus over here that keeps my water at a certain temperature. For this, we're going to use 175. A lot of teas, uh, especially when you pr uh, prepare them in this fashion, you would want to rinse the leaves first, drain it immediately, and then uh, let it steep. But silver needles should be fine without doing that.
and we'll let that go about two minutes. What's the caffeine? Uh, well, that there is some myth surrounding white tea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you hear various things. I, I know it's been said by some people that white tea has no caffeine. That isn't true, but nonetheless, it does not have as much as other types of tea. Okay. Generally, the, the, least, the less oxidized the tea is, uh, the, the less caffeine it presents. And I, I don't know that that necessarily has to do with the, the properties of the, I mean, I think the, the, the plant that grew this tea probably has as much caffeine per, you know, given weight of the plant as one that would be much higher, typically. I think it's more in the way that it, because of the processing, it allows the, the caffeine to come out into the drink. And that also is, you know, another thing with regards to uh, comparing coffee and tea. Mm -hmm. uh, coffee has more caffeine than tea generally. Uh, <coughs> but I think, and from what I've read, is that it also contain that is coffee also contains other chemicals or alkaloids or whatever that accentuate the the effect of caffeine, whereas tea is known to contain phytochemicals that kind of mitigate the effect of caffeine. So we're about ready for this. I guess the other good news is with this method of preparation and these types of teas, and something that if you're only using tea bags, maybe uh, surprised to learn that not only can these teas be infused multiple times, but often the second, third, maybe even fourth uh, infusion is better than the first. Or I'm thinking of, we, we have an oolong tea coming up, and that's one that my past experience is that, OK, by the time you get to the third infusion, that's when it starts to really get good. So. Very nice. So those tasting the tea, what's your thought? Is it very del I mean, it's probably very delicate. You might not be used to drinking yes. something that, that is that delicate. Yeah. But there, it almost tastes like when it's a flavored water. I mean, it's not as yeah, strong as you would think that it was. Especially, you know, smelling it, it smelled much stronger. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I would say in regards to this tea is to wait for it. That everybody ever taste it. Half of the the experience is the aftertaste. That that's the highly desired part of it is the the lingering aftertaste that presents itself after you've drunk it. And for that reason, it is one of my favorites. So this is a tea that I do not have with me today, yellow tea. This class of teas is the rarest. It's um, because there are so few things of it. I, I've seen from the Teespring site that I have gotten tea from before that evidently other varieties are being developed in China actively yet today. So. So is yellow tea just the less popular tea? Is that why people don't drink it? Or? No, it, it doesn't have anything to do with popularity. It's just that the uh, the technique used to produce it, which I'll put back to the the slide here that shows the different methods. This uh, slow drying, it's basically, as I understand it, the leaves are subjected to like a low heat for a long period of time, which is kind of unique to that type of tea. So in reality, it is fairly similar. I mean, definitely in appearance and, and everything to green tea, but the, the flavor that it produces is distinct. But overall, it's, it's similar to green tea, but distinct enough to be its own classification. So when you're preparing them in the Chinese way or more ceremonially, uh, the ceremony, by the way, is called Gong Fu which is related or the same as Kung Fu, like the martial art. And basically what it means is a highly accomplished art. So, and there are whole schools in China that 
deal with, you know, the, the presentation of preparing the tea and uh, generally when they do that, they're not too worried about the water. I mean, they, <laughs> It, what hits the cup hits the cup, and what goes off goes off, so that's okay. So, so what are the, the second round of people thinking of silver needle? It's very delicate, but I like the aftertaste. Oh, good, good. So are all teas supposed to, the water's not supposed to be over 175, or is it just for this one? No, it's specific to the tea. So we'll, we'll have teas later, that it's fine to infuse them right off the boil. So. In fact, uh, this uh, little uh, water boiler that I have, it's called a Zoji Rushi, which is the company that made it. It has three presets. 175, 195, and 205. So basically, the 175 is intended more for the whites and some greens, and the 195 would be for oolongs, and the 205 would be for blacks. As you continue to steep it further, uh, you can increase time and temperature to, to draw things. Uh, I did open this package uh, two days ago and I tried it and I threw that in the fridge when I left for work and when I came back I pulled it out and did a few more infusions and was plenty happy with it. So. <laughs> okay, so on to green teas. Now, green teas, like white teas, are unoxidized for the most part and they're probably the biggest category of tea, especially when you're talking the world of Chinese tea. Um, there are so many different methods of uh, shaping the leaves and th there's just so much variety it's, it's hard to convey to you if you're not aware. Uh, there's like a list of the <coughs> 10 most famous Chinese teas and well most of them are greens. And I do have two green teas with me today. And they could be more different from one another. The first one, where is it? It's called Longjing or Dragon Well. It's one of the more famous uh, <coughs> Chinese green teas. The leaves are very flat. And this is uh, a deal where it's pan fired on a, on a walk. And that's what that looks like. So the thing I'm going to use to make this dragon well for you today, this I actually got at a tea van. It's a, just a double walled uh, tea glass, which, I mean, it's not specifically made for doing this type of tea. Just with dragon well, it, it does well with uh, like a tall, if I had, I wish I had a large, tall and skinny guy one. That would be what's mm -hmm. perfect. Uh, because the leaves actually do put on a little bit of a show uh -huh. when it's brewed, or they can. I, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing the performance here, but basically they'll kind of stand up straight. Mm -hmm. This might not be high enough quality dragon well to see that, but again, I'll use a pretty uh, generous portion. And one of the things you may ask, well, where's he getting these temperatures and these times and all that from? Well, the, the first place you should start is look at the label and see, it should tell you that. It says one plus, which in this thing, lingo means like a big heaping uh, teaspoon, per six ounce cup for three minutes at 180. Now, I've been at it long enough, I know a few things about some of these teas, so I might think, well, that really should be a little bit cooler, or try it a little bit warmer, or not as long. And sometimes, you know, if you're using, doing it more of a, a gong fu pre uh, present day preparation, you might want to up the quantity and then lessen either the 
the time or the the temperature. Okay, so the other green tea that I brought today haven't even opened yet. And this here is a tea that is renowned, Japan is renowned for producing, called Sencha. And who, who was it that was surprised at the greenness of the of, uh, dragon roll? Well, wait till you see this one. Oh my. Wow, it's fluorescent. Rapidly moving to a whole universe of tea. It's a consumerism to one of my favorites. And part of why, uh, why oolong is such a favorite of mine is that it's such a huge category. You can have oolongs that are, basically they're all partially oxidized. Uh, and with oolongs that can mean, yes. What do you mean when it? If they're unoxidized, and I should have put that slide first. I'll move ahead. <clears throat> so, to tell you what oxidation is, and uh, I, I maybe have talked about fermentation too. In the tea industry, uh, it's often called fermentation, even though they don't really mean actual fermentation. We're in, you know, like in cheese and all those type of things, they don't mean that. They mean oxidation, like when you bite into an apple. I take a bite out of an apple, sit on the table, come back to it five minutes later. That flesh, that white flesh of the apple is going to be somewhat brown by the time you get back to it. That's oxidation that's occurring. And that's what's happening to these leaves because uh, they're, they're being essentially bruised. Like when the tea pickers pick the, the buds off of the tea plant, like we have for silver needle, they're not using their fingertips, their fingernails, because you risk bruising the leaf and initiating mm -hmm. oxidation. They're using the ball of their hand to pick those tea buds off of there. So, well, and then the oxidation is usually associated with sugar. So there's sugar in this thing? Well, I think all plants make their own food in the form of a sugar, so. Not a botanist, but. <laughs> so I know that's the, the, that is the product of photosynthesis as far as I know. Okay, so rapidly moving on through our teas. So back to, on oolong teas with oxidation, you can have an oolong that's very lightly oxidized, meaning it's not too much beyond what a green tea is. So it's a very lightly oxidized and therefore yields a, a very uh, light cup, I mean, understandably. Or you can have those that are as much as 80s or 90% or, or oxidized. And they're very <laughs> close to in their flavor to like a black tea. And then there's everything in between. And I think what we have today falls somewhat in the middle. This one is called Ti Kuan Yin, which means the Iron Goddess of Mercy. And it's one of the most famous oolong tea. <coughs> Part of the, the joy of, of drinking oolongs like this is uh, watching what they call the, the agony of the leaves. Uh, these leaves are kind of rolled up into a ball, and that occurs during the manufacture process. They're, you know, a whole great big glob of tea leaves is tied in a bag, and that's run through like a, a machine that kind of twists the, the bag, and over time you know, makes them ball up, and then they just end up in that form. But as they're steeped in water, they will unfurl, and you get to. You know, by the time you know you're on your third infusion, you get to see the leaves in there. It looks like they just came off the plant. <laughs> so, how long can you keep it in the pouch like that? Well, if you keep it sealed in the pouch, it it should keep a while. I mean, for most teas, the sooner you drink them after they're made, the better. That's just flat. So, therefore, 
if you can't drink it right away, then you need to store it as best you can, which means limiting the exposure to air, light, heat. Don't, don't let them get wet, like good ones. But, uh, what about freezing it? Is that? Well, I think it's the same way with coffee. I've always been told not to freeze coffee because it will cause condensation inside the, the package that's being held, and that's bad. So, but otherwise, yeah, that would otherwise take care of things. I mean, they do freeze dry, like coffees and, and such. <clears throat> the other thing is, you want to guard when you're storing your teas. You don't want to keep it like right next to your onions or anything. Because <laughs> tea, tea is a, a food that is good about absorbing other flavors. So. Don't, don't keep it next to your onions or your garlic or anything with a strong flavor. I mean, well, this is one of my uh, prized possessions. This is a Yixing teapot. It's made with a special purple clay that has properties for uh, maintaining its temperature. And you never, like, you don't run this through the dishwasher or anything. It, uh, Cut and, and when you wash it, you really you don't even really use soap. You just rinse it well. And because the, the more often you make tea out of it, you season it. And you only should make one type of tea. Like this is my Yixing teapot for oolong teas. I have another one at home that's I use for the Pu'er teas. It's in the shape of a pig, like the, the Chinese zodiac animal pig. So, so that is what these tools here are for. To, you need a pick to make sure that the spout is clear of the leaves and this to push leaves in there. And this is probably a thing where it, it's better if you do have, I, I mentioned a drainage canning. But I've improvised at home with like a, a cutting board that has, uh, I don't know, what, like little edges that, mm -hmm. that the water could collect in and could kind of set it over the sink so that anything that did run off further would drain down into the sink. And that way, you put the leaves in here, you fill it to the top with water, put the lid on, and then you continue pouring hot water over mm -hmm. it as you wait for it to wow. finish and then get it all poured out. Yeah. This is another thing that's more specifically for oolongs. This one would be uh, so much at the oolong we have today probably would be the, the, the most commonly drunk tea with it. This is more of the, the lighter range of oxidation, the ones that are called uh, Puchongs, Puch Puchongs, I don't remember which guy. <laughs> it's a lightly oxidized uh, oolong. They're very popular in like Taiwan. Uh, they have a very, very floral scent. And so what you do is you put the tea in this cup. This is the scent cup. Then you top it with the tasting cup. And then you flip it over and then you use this to get the, the scent of the tea. It's a scent cup. <coughs> and then you can drink from the tasting cup. So. And I, I just don't really have the facility to prepare it with the Yixing teapot. So I think I'm just going to use a conventional one. So I'll kind of describe for you. My main home modus operandi, which is the, this is kind of like my daily driver this teapot and, well, the one I got before it. Uh, I can't recommend them highly enough. Uh, I, I've left the other one at home. It's kind of enshrined in that place of, uh, <laughs> of uh, importance in my home because it, it just has been such a, a faithful servant in that, you know, that's, that's the reason porcelain came about was because Previously, if you poured boiling water on pottery, it would not survive <laughs> the, the experience because it's too hot. Well, with, with the advent of porcelain, which of course 
came about in China. And we could probably do another story about another a Robert Fortune type story of how the secrets of making porcelain pottery and, and that was brought to the Western world, but I digress. Anyhow, uh, that teapot I have at home, and, and this one now is getting some experience behind it. Uh, daily, I make tea using it. And, you know, loose leaf tea to me is not uh, that big of a hassle, nor that big of a cleanup. You just have a, a teapot that accommodates an infuser basket that you can take out and remove. Put the infuser basket in there, put the required quantity of tea in there, pour the water in there, put the lid on it. And if you're unfamiliar with a tea cozy, <coughs> they aren't just uh, for decorative purposes. They have a real purpose, and they really do work. I have a couple different matching hot pads and cozies. And this is how you keep your tea from getting cold before you're done drinking it. It makes all the difference in the world having this over the hot pot. It really works. Do you heat your pot before you go to make the tea? Mm -hmm. You should, but I don't always. <laughs> You're supposed to. That's pretty consistent in the, in the tea culture of, of either China or yeah. other that you would. So you, it, metal is a no-no, but plastic is OK? Well, plastic isn't metal, so. <laughs> well, when when those uh, elements were, you know, and, and that whole thing was devised, I don't think plastic was around. So I think it's given a pass, okay. as well as the nylon that the mesh is made of. So. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, but, well, lastly, among the teas that I brought with me today are black teas. We'll talk about other teas yet, but. Uh, I brought two black teas with me today, kind of representing both of the traditions. Uh, the first is uh, a Chinese black. This is uh, Kimu. This is one of the most famous Chinese black teas. And in fact, if you've had a decent, like, blended tea where several different kinds are combined into one, uh, it likely contains some grain or another of, of this in it, if it contains any Chinese tea at all. So, and this is a, a little bit nicer grade. You could probably go higher yet. And the other tea that I brought is a Darjeeling tea, and that's probably one that you've heard of. I know back in my pre-awakened uh, tea days, that that was uh, one of the three kinds I knew, Earl Grey, Darjeeling, and whatever else. <laughs> so, Orange people. Yes, I will be talking about that <coughs> shortly. Uh, this is a second flush. Uh, there's, in the Dar Darjeeling is a region in India, and the teas there are the most highly prized in that region. Uh, and the first flush are known well-known for their kind of like wine-like muscatel uh, flavor, very highly prized. As second flush are also prized. I, I don't think that you ever hear much about the winner third flush. We have that, and this one has a grade of, well, it's not, okay, it's printed on here. If, if any of you do go to like the Upton website, you will quickly be confronted by T grades. And I think they use it, well, as I talk about later, they are kind of a marketing tool, but it also uh, refers to like the size of, a, of the leaf and what size of sieve it will pass through. And this one, for example, is SFT GFOP1, which means super fine, typical flowery orange peco. <laughs> Great so. <laughs> okay. so don't be too uh, <laughs> blinded by those uh, tea grades because that's merely what they mean. The tippy part refers to the 
percentage content of the buds, like the silver needle, that would be all, that's all tips. If a T, that's prized. If it, the more tips are in a T, the, the more highly that's prized. Here's a tea that I didn't bring with me. I talked about it earlier. I can't either. I've had it many times before. I've had it in this form. This, right. What this picture is is a compressed tea disc. It would be about uh, uh, this big in diameter called a bing cha. And basically what you do is you, you have to use a knife. Uh, you break off pieces and you infuse it uh, similar to what we've done today. Uh, like I said, I have a another Yixing teapot that's larger than this one that I kind of reserve for the use with uh, Pu'er teas. And it's one in particular that you can steep and re-steep. You can go like 10 times with it. So it, it can really produce a lot of tea for you. And uh, some people call it like the coffee lover's tea because it is so, especially if you have like the cooked version, the, the more modern, uh, accelerated fermentation version. Fermentation? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a note about flavored teas. So, flavored teas are usually, I don't know, usually, they're often black teas. Uh, I'm sure they've sold every kind of tea. I wouldn't think they would play for yellows, but I wouldn't put it past anybody, so. Uh, typically, the tea that you would use to add flavoring to wouldn't be of the highest quality, because with this, you're mostly going for the flavoring that you're adding. So, I don't know, I, I tend not to drink flavored teas, just because I'm more interested in exploring the flavors that those varieties that are there have to offer. And since that is so diverse and so uh, undiscovered for me, I, I'm perfectly happy to do that. Not that I mean, not that I don't like these flavors that you see up here, but, and, and maybe they would taste really yummy with, paired with the tea, but I, I don't know, I, I, I just haven't been big on that. I used to consider myself to be uh, a big Earl Grey drinker, uh, but like I said, that was before I discovered other things, and now Earl Grey is kind of down on my list. I, I don't care for it so much anymore. I guess I liked it before I knew any better. Now I don't really even like the taste of it. And if you're wondering what Earl Grey is and you didn't hear me uh, telling this lady earlier, it's basically just a flavored tea. It's flavored with the oil of bergamot, which is an oil derived from the peel of a citrus fruit. So, so what are you finding as flavoring the teas versus a tea that might be like a white rose tea or something that would have, is there a difference or? Yeah, I guess I would, when I say flavored teas, I mainly mean ones that have the flavoring you know, some agent like like the oil of bergamot or the oil of, or some, any sort of agent that would part like a, a fruit flavor. Uh, I do often get a rose kangu, which is basically a black, Chinese black tea that's scented with rose. Uh, so it does have a, a flavoring, you know, kind of like rose water, only tea. So maybe, maybe I do cheat a little. But I, I might put those in a different category. Jasmine tea would be another uh, big one. That's like a, a green tea that's often infused with like ja jasmine flowers and very scented. I was actually a big drinker of that at one time. I wanted to talk a little bit about iced teas. Again, I can't say that I never drink iced tea. However, I very rarely do so, um, mainly because if you, uh, if you drink something ice cold, then you're not tasting a lot of that something. 
That's why I let them in like their beer. I hope because they don't, they don't like the taste of beer. <laughs> they like to drink it, but they don't like the taste. So they drink it ice cold. And this is a tea, just, the, the shape of the leaf is very small. It's not a very large leaf tea, so you can kind of use your standard measurements and be fine. This is Ki Moon, the Chinese black tea. There you go. And this longer you make with boiling water. It's interesting. Maybe when it cools off. You make it with boiling water? Yep. Before I do that, I'll just give a note about milk and sugar. Uh, or lemon. Uh, for the most part, well, I never add those to my tea. Here we go. With blacks, that's where it, it does become a thing. Uh, it's uh, in the tradition of the, uh, the ones produced in India, typically. Uh, I believe, if, if people say that it enhances the flavor of some blacks, I, I do believe that, that it, they enhance the flavor with milk and sugar. But generally, I guess my judgment is that if that's the case, I, I'd rather be drinking another tea than... <laughs> So can't say I've never, never done it, but it's fairly good. Uh, I, I, I'm out to, to find teas that stand out well on their own. And that there, I do want to let you know that in some places in the world, not only do they drink tea, but they also eat it. Uh, this here is a product of Myanmar, also known as Burma. And this is one of their uh, traditional dishes. Um, I don't think I know how to pronounce it. It's L-E-P-H-E-T, but I don't think it's pronounced left it. But that's what it looks like. So how do they eat it? It's uh, pickled, so it's like pickled and salty. It's what you see in the center there. Mm. And then it's served with, th this is the typical uh, serving of it, along with those things. And like the ingredients on here, basically in this package there's a bag full of the pickled tea, and then another bag that has fried garlic, baked sesame, baked peanuts, fried butterfly peas, fried Australian peas, fried glam chickpeas, salt, lemon, garlic, peanuts, oil, sunflower. So it's, it's kind of like a salad. Hmm. So you would eat this with your tea? Or you just eat well, oh, that's that's good. Good. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> pair with, I mean, oh, maybe they, eat it along with their tea, I, I don't know, but it's uh, done as a salad, and it's a very common dish in, in that culture. I haven't been brave enough to try mine, though. I just found this uh, at the, one of the Asian groceries in Storm Lake the other day, so I haven't tried it yet. So just kind of reviewing what I've already uh, mentioned, where is tea grown? Uh, this is Yunnan province. So this is kind of where it all started and naturally Vietnam, I bet. I don't know what they do. Uh, Burma, which is also Myanmar. Evidently Bangladesh is a big tea producer I, I found, but I've never had tea from there. That whole area. As far as those tea bags that we get in the grocery store, they mostly come from India and a lot of them from Sri Lanka. What am I doing on the tea? I, gotta, I don't often use it, but this is like a three minute glass. This is a three minute, a four minute, and a five minute. Never seen those. Uh, also, if you do go on to like a, the Upton Tea site, they still call uh, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, and Taiwan Formosa for some reason. I don't know why that's persisted, but that seems to be a thing in the tea industry. So if you see Ceylon, it means it's Sri Lanka today, and Formosa is just a 
Then the Taiwan ones went away. Okay, well, I think our tea break is ready. I was asked about the porcelain teapots and what my recommendations were. And I guess I was hurrying back to that teapot that I left at home that I love so much. Basically, what the ones I'm using right now, both the red one and the white one I'm holding, are kind of like recreations of that teapot that have been commissioned by Upton Tea. Oh, I still have a by a, here. Uh, here. There's one that's empty. Can you just put a little bit? By a company here in the United States to manufacture. This is the one. But you still buy it through Upton? Yes, I've gotten all these uh, large traditional looking teapots through Upton. Basically, they have all these grades. Like Orange Pico is not a, it's not, that's the Orange Pico plant. That's not a thing. Uh, Orange Pico just refers to a, like a, a grade of tea, the size of the leaf. There, there's both orthodox grades and there's broken tea grades. So like full leaves are considered to be the orthodox grades. So like this is an orthodox grade because it doesn't have, B, if it was BOP, that would be broken orange pepper, which would refer to a broken leaf. And then past that, there's other sets of grades. And these grades mainly apply to teas from India and Sri Lanka. Yeah, this, this grade is pretty nice. Super typical, super fine, typical golden flower, orange pico, grade one. And then often they'll tack on things like uh, clonal or different things like that. There's even, I've seen one where, I don't know if it was actually part of the grade, but they assigned it a special grade because the, the tea plants had been visited by a specific kind of fly and must have done cause some sort of oxidation uh, through its ministrations to the leaf and so maybe I didn't buy the tea and I've never had it so it could all just be marketing mumbo jumbo for all I know but allegedly it imparted some unique characteristics to the tea. Just so you know in the worldwide the second popular beverage after water is tea. Not coffee? Oh, no. That's American. All the world. Coffee. Maybe in Spencer, Iowa, it is. I don't know. <laughs> but in this country, I would imagine coffee. Well, I would believe if, if you told me that coffee was more popular than tea, than tea in this country, I don't know if I can reliably say that coffee is the most second most popular beverage. Maybe it's Coca-Cola, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, just my recommendations for making good tea is measure the amount of tea that you use, control the temperature of the water, and control the amount of time. Those are the three key points to making good tea. And, of course, start with... Uh, most, not all those yeah. teas, the key moon you probably went uh, steep multiple times, nor the star chain, but it's about everything else does well and teas multiple times. Those are the two in common to find a, a bag that is a little bit better about letting leaves open up. So naturally they're containing a higher grade of tea than tea does. They're expensive. But they tend to be more expensive according. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they're cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to throw them away. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Infuse them three times and then they're going to go in there. My recommendation is having an infuser basket. Oh, and I guess lastly, yeah. Uh, I encourage people to kind of do their own research and make their own opinions on like the tea benefit, the health benefits of tea. Uh, I do think it is something that contributes to your health, right? Regularly drinking tea. Uh, I think it is pretty well known that uh, there are chemicals <coughs> that in particular are found in green teas that, that do contribute to your health uh, and, the, and that do have like calming agents in, in them. I, I think that's proven. Um, 
but I've known people that will take like a pill of green tea a day. It's like, Excited. To me, that takes away part of the, the health benefit right there because to me, for me, part of the health benefit is doing the ritual of preparing the tea and, and everything that goes along with it. But that's, that's where part of the health benefit comes from. So I would hate to see someone miss out on that. So if, if it comes down to you have to take a pill, I, I don't know if I'd agree. <laughs> I like my tea at this liquid form. This little. Uh, so I know a lot of you have asked, and I anticipated uh, where to shop for tea. So I'm going to tell you where I shop. It doesn't mean that uh, these are the only places. These are some good places, including a local place. There's a fine tea shop right in Des Moines, in the East Village, down by somewhat near the Capitol. Uh, we've gone down for legislative events and definitely uh, take the opportunity to go there. That's on 414 East 6th Street in uh, Des Moines. That's Gong Fu Tea. So yeah, they named their shop after the, the tea ceremony that I'm <coughs> describing. And you can even get things. Uh, you, I think you can order an oolong uh, to be prepared in the Gong Fu style, and they may even do it for you. Otherwise, the mail order house I've by far and away done the most through is Upton Tea Imports. Uh, I'd say their strength is like teas from India and, and that, but they carry it from all over the world. I ordered from Imperial Tea Court, which is it's both a physical shop and a mail order place. You can do mail order from Des Moines too, so yeah, you can get everything. <coughs> uh, I've got a lot of my tea wares from Imperial Tea Court. They specialize in like Chinese style tea, or if you want it directly from China, uh, Teespring, again, that's T-E-A Spring, not the t-shirt shop, T-E-A Spring. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can, something to watch for there is like sometime in April or late April, look for the pre-Qingming, with a Q, Q-I-N-G, M-I-N-G, Qingming teas. Those are especially highly prized Chinese teas. Uh, it means before the rains. Uh, they're picked before the Qingming festival, before the, the weather becomes rainy, and those teas are highly prized for their, their flavor. And at least I mean, you have some, I don't know about assurance, but some promise that you're <laughs> getting something very fresh. And I've had some excellent tea come from there, and it doesn't take all that long to get here, even though it is being shipped directly from China. And if uh, you want to share your tea drinking experiences online, uh, there's a social network <coughs> that's devoted especially for uh, This is called steepster.com. If you go on there, my name's Tea Brarian. Uh, I'd gladly friend you. and. Interact with you on there. Uh, you can post tasting notes. You can post the contents of your tea cabinet and a few other features. It's a lot of fun. And beyond that, enjoy your tea and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.